Good evening, and I'd like to call to order the January 23rd, 2023 regular board meeting of the East Bend School District Board of School Directors. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. All right, well, it's my pleasure to introduce again our EHS Student Government Association members who are here to give their report, uh, Ms. Michalski and Ms. Hess. Good evening. We would like to start by congratulating all of the students who submitted their artwork to the 2023 Scholastic Art Awards. Amaya students relieve, received six gold keys, 13 silver keys, and 48 honorable mentions. Their artwork will be on display from February 18th to March 5th at the Miller Gallery at Kutztown University. Another congratulations to the Emmaus High School dance team who will be heading to nationals in March and the cheer team that will be heading to states in Hershey this weekend. The Avidum Club is selling t-shirts during all lunches on January 27th to raise funds for the National Alliance on Mental Health. The shirts cost $10. The EHS Orchestra will be hosting its coffee house on February 16th in the EHS cafeteria. And finally, tickets for the theater department's production of Fiddler on the Roof will be available on the EHS website starting February 1st. Good evening. So just to start off with a few quick sports announcements, um, we have five winter sports going on right now, first of which is basketball, which has a game tomorrow night at 7.30 against Northampton at home with a minion out theme. Um, so probably the most exciting theme this year. Um, and then we have our rifle team. Our co-ed varsity is going against East Stroudsburg North High School at 3.30 at home also tomorrow. Um, swimming and diving teams, boys varsity meets against Liberty at 4 p.m. at home tomorrow, and girls varsity also meets against Liberty at 4 at Liberty tomorrow. Um, wrestling is meeting against Whitehall High School at 7 p.m. at Whitehall, I believe on Wednesday. Um, and just a future announcement, boys volleyball season is coming up and open gyms are starting, starting tomorrow actually from 3 to 5 p.m. and those will continue into February. So just a few upcoming events, uh, just a reminder of the International Fair, um, which is coming back this year for the first time in a while, and we're very excited about it. That is to be held on February 25th. It's a Saturday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. In addition, we wanted to highlight a student opportunities group from Marking Period 3 um, that is SGA we just think is really awesome. It is five skill building groups offered during Marking Period 3. These groups include Conflict Resolution, Arts Quest Education Program, Healthy Relationships, Study Skills, and LGBTQ Plus Support. Um, and we're just really glad to see that being offered to all of our students here. Um, and then a final little update here is the next edition of The Stinger. Um, this issue will be doing a feature on Black History Month and will be released the week of February 20th. Um, we look forward to releasing that paper and hope everybody gets their hands on a copy. And just one piece of SGA news, Snowco is February 9th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Tickets are $15 each and tickets are on sale until the 27th. This is our first snow, Snowco since us seniors were freshmen and basically none of went. So it's almost like an entirely new dance at this point. So we're very excited. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that report. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Yes, point of order, you. my household dictates that I point out there are two basketball teams in Mayas High School. Yes, of course. Boys I apologize. It's, it's okay. <laughs> Say, That's my bad. Thank you. Thank you for that very important clarification. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay, well, as always, we, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, you're welcome to stay for the meeting, or if you have other things you'd like to do tonight, you're also welcome to leave. But, Unfortunately, so. we both have homework, even okay. though midterms was last week, so All we right. will be heading out. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, and you have a good evening, and good luck with your homework. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is approval of the minutes for the January 9th, 2023 regular board meeting. May I have a motion? So moved. Uh, I, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> I skipped the request. I'm very sorry. I was so eager to approve the minutes. I guess. All right, so next on the agenda is the request to address the board. Uh, we have one tonight, uh, but before I call that individual, I'd like to read the following statement. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with public comment, speakers should feel free to express their opinion, comment, or question, and understand that this is not an interactive engagement with the board or with the administration. 
Please direct your comments to the chair, be respectful, not engage in profane rhetoric, and be mindful that others, including students, may be listening. I would request that you consider that protocol when making your comments. For the members of the audience, please also be respectful and refrain from speaking during the public comment period. With that, I will now announce our speaker and, and his topic. When you step up to the podium, again, state your name, and you will have three minutes within which to speak. And again, I apologize for skipping, <laughs> skipping over that before. I'd like to invite Mr. Frank Doubleton uh, to, to speak on math. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, uh, my topic was math again, because I've been up here before to talk about math. Uh, I see you have a vote scheduled later tonight to invest $126,000 into a two-year contract with Panorama Group. Uh, this com company's program is to help with the SEL surveys and student information. I don't understand why the board would e even entertain spending on anything but else but math right now. The East Penn School District had another disaster of math PSSA results in 2022. We are now under 50% proficiency in the PSSAs for the last two years. So we've started a trend. But worse yet, uh, we have a middle school that is under 25% proficiency in math. Uh, and I'd like to repeat that for each board member. We have a middle school that has a math proficiency of less than 25% in this district. 25%. So you can vote tonight for more intrusive surveys of the children, but shouldn't this money be used to improve our math education? Obviously, surveys don't help here. That's a lot of money, and uh, the math issue is, is becoming uh, a trend. This math problem is not the teacher's fault. This is definitely a leadership issue. We look to you guys to lead the district and, and to build and improve on this. So the school board has a choice to say if math education is important to them tonight. Intrusive surveys versus math. You know, do we, where do we invest? Mr. Saul goes to a lot of trouble to uh, spend $170 million and we need to invest in math. Now, I know we have Vesser money and I understand that. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I do follow. Uh, so I'd ask you to think about your priorities tonight and what needs to be done at a board level here in the management level uh, to help this uh, math problem under 50% the, as the school and under 25% as one school. That's, uh, that doesn't sound like the district of choice to me. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is the minutes um, for, for the, to approve from the January 9th meeting. Moved. Second. Any questions, comments from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, you please call the roll. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Next on the agenda is the district update from Dr. Campbell. Good evening, thank you. I have a few repeats from our SGA representatives, but I promise I will be brief on those. Um, I too also wanted to start off by congratulating the Emmaus High School dance team. Earlier this month, they finished second at the Universal Dance Association Northeast Regional Tournament that was held in Philadelphia. And as a result of their great performance, they now advance to nationals, so we wish them luck. Um, you also heard earlier from our SGA student reps that we have 32 students from Emmaus High School who have been awarded um, 
gold keys, silver keys, and honorable mentions, which are the honorary designations through the 2020, 20, through the 2023 Scholastic Art Awards. This is an art um, program that's sponsored by the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers. Um, I do. I would like to recognize six of our 32 students, and we've honored them all on our, our district website, but I wanted to point out those six Emmaus High School students who will be advancing to the national level of the competition, specifically Michaela Fox, Madison Miller, Samuel Strem Strzempak, and Mandy Zhang. I'd also like to provide an update for families of Emmaus High School students. Um, certainly... Lunch at Emmaus High School um, is certainly something of interest, I think, to many families. I say that because you can appreciate with a school of 2,800 students, we do have large groups of students having their lunch at a single time. And so we're always looking for ways to um, serve students quickly, provide them with a positive dining experience, so to speak, and to be able to um, get them their food quickly so they're not having to wait in long lines. And so um, the announcement is that in CAF 2, which is our one of our smaller cafeterias, we did open up a new serving station specifically that includes a deli bar, a pizza bar, salad bar, and snacks, all of which are available with little or no lines. And so um, I say that to our families to, you know, please have conversations with your high school students and we're always interested in their feedback in terms of how we're meeting their needs. You also heard earlier that spring sports signups are now open and they close um, at the very beginning of February. And so we certainly want our student athletes um, who are eligible to visit the high school athletic website to sign up. I'm also very excited to share that on March 28th, our East Penn Education Foundation, in conjunction with our high school counseling department, will be um, hosting its 2023 Career Exploration Fair. Um, we are so excited to be able to continue this phenomenal event for our students and our school community. It's held here at the Emmaus High School um, gym. And so again, that's coming up on March 28th. And please continue to watch for more information. I'll also put this out there as a public service announcement for our local businesses. If there's anyone who's interested in coming in and signing up to share their career experience with our, our students in the district, we'd certainly love to have you. So please check out the Education Foundation website for more information. As previously announced, we're also excited um, that the Emmaus High School Theater Program will be presenting Fiddler on the Roof. Again, that performance will be March 29th through April 1st. Tickets are available online, and I also always remind our senior community that a complimentary performance for our senior gold card members will be held on Tuesday, March 28th at 6 p.m. And it's hard to believe after we've had some 50, almost 60 degree weather um, in the month of December and early January, but today was sort of a reminder to all of us that it is still winter. And so I, I just thought I'd take a couple minutes at tonight's board meeting not that this is any prediction as to the fact that we're going to have any inclement weather later this week, but I just wanted to take a few minutes publicly to review with the board and really with our community the process through which we go as a team when we have to consider due to inclement weather if we'll have a delay, a snow day, or a flexible instructional day. So I wanted to, again, just spend a little bit of time talking about our process one of the first pieces of information is um, when inclement weather is predicted, we have a number of weather services and apps that provide the district with customized updates on predictions for the zip codes within our school district. If closing is a certainty, meaning the weather prediction is um, there's, there's a high likelihood, a very high certainty that inclement weather is coming. There may be times in which we make a call for a school closing or a delay the night before the actual event. Sometimes, not always. Um, otherwise, we as a team, um, when I say the team, I'm always appreciative of our facilities director, um, our student services director, STA management, and myself, we monitor roads and campus conditions the morning of a weather event, typically beginning around 4.30 a.m. I remind the district that East Penn is about 40 square miles, 
including some rural mountainous regions. And so I certainly can appreciate that there might be times in, way in which we make a call for a weather situation. And you might look out in your residential neighborhood and things look relatively okay. But again, we have some mountainous areas in which the travel conditions really might not be safe for our students. The other piece is Lehigh County superintendents communicate with each other so that we can share information across school districts um, and have an understanding in which the travel conditions might impact all of our 1,200 staff members who are coming to us from various locations. And given all those factors, we attempt to make a decision by about 5.15 in the morning. Um, I appreciate that any change in a normal school schedule creates disruptions for families and for parents and students, and we take the decision very seriously and always prioritize the health and safety of our students as well as our staff. And so I also wanted to use tonight, um, we did put information out on social media today, but if there are any families who have a preference and would like to receive the 5 a.m. calls or text message regarding school for the day, um, please make sure that you have updated your communication preferences with us via school messenger. And so again, on social media today, we did remind families as to how to update that information. Similarly, if you prefer not to hear my, my voice at 5.15 in the morning, I can completely respect that as well. Um, and you can opt out of that service from the district. And finally, as this is our last board meeting in January, and as I shared at our last um, board meeting, January is recognized by PSBA as School Board Member Appreciation Month, and I just wanted to end our uh, my update tonight again by reiterating our appreciation and gratitude to our tremendous school board members for their um, outstanding commitment to our students and the East Penn community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Are there any questions or comments for Superintendent? Mr. Champagne. Uh, yeah, on a matter with respect to communication, I saw uh, over the weekend where North Penn has implemented a, a bus tracking system. It's an app that parents can put on their phone, uh, it tracks the bus, it tracks their kids on the bus. Uh, they got a grant for it. Um, and I was just wondering if it's something that you have seen or heard about and whether it's worth exploring uh, for this district. Um, it seems to be well received by the uh, the, the community at North Penn, uh, but it would just be another tool, especially with, you know, how buses have a tendency sometimes to run late and um, are not necessarily to their own, not, uh, on their own fault, but just traffic conditions or other issues, uh, giving parents more information regarding their, you know, bus and the, the, the travel time. So I just put it out there for your, your thoughts. Yeah, very preliminary, I'll, I will say, um, we are familiar with such apps and tracking devices in the event that it would be something in which the district is interested in considering for the future, certainly as we consider our next contract with our transportation provider, that could be something that we would identify as a priority because certainly you'd need um, Wi-Fi availability within your buses. But again, certainly something on which that we can consider as we approach that next um, contract. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Campbell. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, we're going to start a, a, an extended series of, uh, of uh, presentations and discussion about uh, next year's budget. Uh, uh, tonight is that first step. And Dr. Campbell, if you would like to introduce what we're doing with our first look. Yes, thank you. I appreciate um, that introduction, Dr. Levinson, and, and you are right. Tonight is what we refer to as our as an administrative team, as our first look or our first glance at the budget. Um, Mr. Saul and I are excited to sort of kick off the budget season, and so as we work through the budget process over the next several months. Um, you will hear us say many times that it's important that um, we recognize that the development process, that the budget process 
um, is just that. It is a process that continues to be refined as we work over the next several months. It's also important for our team and the public to understand that some of the financial assumptions that will be shared this evening will certainly become more focused as we progress throughout this winter and spring, as well as as our revenues become more definitive. The other, po the other point, <clears throat> excuse me, that's important to understand about our budget process is that we do strive to make it very collaborative. And so our budget is constructed based on student and organizational needs as articulated in our comprehensive plan. And actually our budget planning for us in East Penn began back this fall um, as we began to solicit input from all of our district and building leaders. Again, those priorities being organized around um, priorities of the district. We want to start off this morning, this afternoon, by sharing the timeline for our budget process. You'll note it that, notice that we begin this evening with an overview of Act One and the preliminary budget. And five months from now, in June, our budget process will uh, conclude with the adoption of the final budget. You can see along the way, we're following a similar process. We're going to take a deep dive into revenues, expenditures, and then we will spend several meetings talking about priorities that we've identified for the upcoming year. And so at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Saul, who's going to kick things off with an overview of the Act One resolution. Thank you. <coughs> so for all of you, um, this will be a review. But I think a review is good because each time we talk about it, it's, it's a refresher. And um, the more you hear it, the more it, it tends to stick. So um, with that, <coughs> as a reminder, Act 1 of 2006 redefined uh, many of the legal requirements for school district budget development and established a very prescriptive process for um, budget approval. And you can see with the timeline, we have that laid out. And there are certain pieces you don't see there that are behind the scenes, that we uh, deadlines that we have to meet. Furthermore, Act 1 established a cost of living cap for school district real estate taxes, referred to as the Act 1 index. Annually, the Pennsylvania Department of Education calculates the base index, which is also sometimes referred to as the statewide index. For 2023-24, the base index is 4.1%. The base index is then adjusted for each school district using a local wealth metric the personal or market value personal income aid ratio is what it actually is. Um, and if your aid ratio is below 0.4, just for, for matters of this calculation, um, it's unadjusted. So there are some districts that, that it's not adjusted. We're above 0.4, so our index gets adjusted. And our adjusted index for 23-24 is 4.9%. Um, therefore, for 2023-24, uh, any real estate tax increase cannot exceed, and the, ca the calculation is there, um, 0.9641 mills, or just under one full mill of real estate tax increase. Um, increasing the real estate taxes up to the Act 1 index would generate approximately an additional $5.3 million in revenue. And that's just increase of the... Of the um, millage rate, remember there's other things like the growth in our tax base that also affect real estate taxes. That's not uh, considered in the, this Act 1 index calculation. On this slide, we can see uh, the Act 1 base index and our adjusted index from the inception in 2006 to present and the movement over the years. And actually, you can see because of that local wealth metric has been um, indicating we're becoming, quote, less wealthy within our school district, um, the growth or the adjustment upward is becoming greater. So you can see that differential. You can also see prior to um, sort of the midpoint there, our index was not adjusted. So that's why you don't see a separate adjusted index then. And that's, as I said earlier, there, there's a certain scenario where it's not adjusted. Act 1 provides for two methods for exceeding the Act 1 index. Um, 
and with a 4.9% index this year, I'm not sure this is something we would want to consider, but we'll review this just as a matter of going through the process. The first is by applying for ex uh, Act 1 exceptions to the Pennsylvania Department of Education, and we'll review that process in just a minute. And the second is um, by putting a voter referendum ballot question on the primary election ballot, asking the voters if you could exceed the Act 1 index. In both scenarios, you have to demonstrate the need to exceed the index. The text of, um, and, and that's uh, identified in the text of Act 1, which says, if a school district adopts a preliminary budget with real estate taxes that exceed its adjusted index, the school district may seek approval for referendum exceptions to increase tax rates by more than the adjusted index. And what they're saying there is, you have to have a balanced budget. So if your expenditures are so high that you have to raise your real estate tax and that exceeds the index, you've now demonstrated the need um, to apply for those exceptions and or then move on to that referendum process. Presently, there are four um, Act 1 exceptions, um, four Act 1 exception categories. The first two are related to very spe specific debt scenarios, which we um, do not and have not qualified for. Um, and will not qualify for in the future, most likely. Um, and the other two, which we've talked about in the past, um, uh, we tend to look at because there's the opportunity there um, if we look at them more closely. The special education exception compares the net special education costs between two years, and PDE always tells us what two years that they'll be that we should use. For this year, they told us to look back at 2021 and compare that with 21-22. And the amount that the cost increase from those, between those two years exceeds the index you, is, is a qualifying exception. So that between those two years, there was a 7% cost increase in our special education expenditures as calculated by that index calculation. I'll just qualify that. So that the amount over the 4.9 is what qualifies. And so we have um, exception capacity, I'll call it, of roughly a half a million dollars with regard to the special education um, exception. The next, the next exception, the public school employees retirement system employer contribution rate exception, provides exception capacity for the amount the employer contribution rate increase exceeds the Act 1 index. And for um, this one, we look at last, the, actually the current year, compared to the budget that we're preparing. And the employer contribution rate in the current year is roughly 26 and a quarter percent, or sorry, 36 and a quarter percent. And next year, it's going down to 34 percent. So the key there is it's going down. So there's no way we could exceed that. Um, and so there's no exception capacity there. So in conclusion, um, the district does not qualify for the two uh, construction exceptions. Also, there's no capacity in the retirement exception, but there is capacity of roughly half a million dollars in the special education exception. Despite the availability of the special education exception, given the district's very high index of 4.9% for 2023-24, the district administration is recommending that the board approve a resolution not to exceed the index for, uh, for budget year 2023-24. Now, procedurally, if the board chooses not to approve a, resolu a resolution, a preliminary budget has to be adopted no later than February 13th. So it would need to be adopted at our next board meeting. We have prepared a first draft, um, as we've done in the past, of the budget that could serve as this preliminary budget. <coughs> as a starting point for the budget process, we'll just briefly go through that. Um, to demonstrate uh, you know, that we have this available should we need it. Also, this will allow us to take a look at, we, we use this as an opportunity to look at like our beginning fund balances and start to build the budget um, through this process of looking at fund balances this evening, and then we'll look at revenues and then expenditures, and we use this methodical process for budget development. So the first step is to look back to fiscal year 21-22, which was last year. Um, and the audit for that was recently completed. So on this slide, number nine, 
Um, in the first column, we can see the original budget that was adopted by the board in June of 2021. And what I'd like to do just to, for matters of orientation is just go through this real quick um, down the first column. So at the top, we see the total revenue that we anticipated, the total expenditures, which includes a reserve line item. What we have historically done in my time here at East Penn is we back out that budgetary reserve so that we look at anticipated expenditures. So ideally, we're not going to spend the reserve. It's there for um, as a rainy day fund, if you will. So then you can see the anticipated expenditures, any surplus or deficit of the revenues over those anticipated expenditures. And then you see the beginning fund balance. Then it, we add or subtract that surplus or deficit, and it would give us an ending fund balance. So in that first column, you could see that we budgeted a structural deficit of nine, uh, $971,000. In the next column, um, which was the estimated um, uh, the estimate that we prepared in June of 2022, you can see, I wanted to point out, you can see that that deficit of 970, uh, roughly a million dollars, let me call it, turned into a surplus of $6 million. The reason for that is that's the year that we received the um, uh, ARP ESSER funds, and we had, not, we had budgeted for some of them, but you may recall that mid-year we sort of changed our approach to how we were going to handle those. And so we um, actually received a majority of the funds that year for ESSER. And then we set aside a similar amount of local funds to be used for those mitigation techniques that we've talked about. And so that's why all of a sudden that year you see a large fund balance um, build up. It's because it, th that's the pot of money that we've set aside um, for those activities. And then finally, in the last column, we can see the actual audited amounts um, for that year. So what we do is we take next to the green arrow, the ending fund balance, the audited ending fund balance, and we roll that over to the next um, sheet, and we update our estimate or the budget that we prepared uh, earlier this year, or sorry, last year in June, and we plug that in as our new beginning fund balance. Again, I'll, I'll just very quickly point out that you can see the deficit of $2.6 million um, in the current year, and that again is that spend down of the funds that we, sent, we set aside. So you can see that with that um, spend down, the new estimated ending fund balance is about $20.8 million, and that's the number now that rolls forward for our new budget, and that's our starting point of, okay, um, sorry, I'm not seeing what I had anticipated seeing. And at the moment, I am not able to figure it out. Let me just continue, and I'll circle back. So with this, the beginning fund balance is shown here is $23.4 million. You can see the budget that has been prepared, the first draft of the budget, with $175 million of revenues, $184 million of expenditures, um, where we've backed out, as I said earlier, <laughs> the budgetary reserve. and. Um, you can see the, the totally anticipated expenditures. Those equal the revenues, and so this is a balanced budget. What we have not done at this point is put in the monies that we're using from that fund for next year. The reason I didn't do that is for purposes of considering adoption of the resolution, what I wanted to demonstrate to the board is that we have a preliminary budget that's a balanced budget and doesn't demand a tax increase. And I felt like if we put in a deficit at this point, it sort of looks like we're demanding a tax increase. Um, so I didn't put it in, but as we look at the budget in future months, those will definitely be in there and we'll talk about that more. Um, finally, on this final slide, um, you can see a comparison of the 2022-23 budget with the first draft of the 2023-24 budget and the changes. 
Again, I point out um, that this doesn't include those um, mitigation expenses. The reason I point that out is in the wage and benefit line item, the percentage increases are artificially low because we're, we're really not comparing an apple to an apple um, because those expenses are in 22-23, but they're not in 23-24. So th those are sort of artificially low because they're not included in both years. So again, the purpose of sharing this first draft of the budget is to demonstrate that um, we have a um, preliminary budget ready to go if the board were not to approve the resolution. Um, as in prior years, we'll provide greater detail regarding the revenues and expenditures in upcoming meetings. And at this point, uh, Mr. President, this concludes the presentation, and I'll entertain any questions the board may have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saul. Mr. Jankowski. Um, as always, thank you. I, I always look forward to uh, your presentations at this time of year. You're very informative and educational. So um, my, my one question is around the Act 1 index, the statewide index. This is a pretty substantial increase from last year to this year as compared to prior years. What's, do you have any insight into what's driving that? I mean, is that based on you know, the macroeconomic trends of the national economy in general, or is it more focused on statewide trends? Like what? Yes. Yeah, so the Act 1 index is made up of two components, which is are the statewide weekly wage rate. So it looks at the increases in wages, as well as the employer cost index for um, a sector of education. So it looks at our cost, employer's cost, and we're in that sector, um, and how they've increased. So it's really a measure of, like, quote, inflationary forces. So it's not looking at us in particular, but no. overall, what are the trends in general in, in this, quote, unquote, industry? Correct. And the other thing I'll point out um, is that this is a backward-facing indicator. So it, you know, it's using historic data to calculate the increase for this year. So I'm actually going to go back to um, this um, the, the index history. So if you think about the Great Recession of 2008, um, you can see it took a couple years to actually see the full impact of that. Um, and so again, it's it, what we're seeing for the budget that we're working on next year, we'll call it, is really the effect of what happened in last year and the previous years. Um, so, And if you think about the pandemic, I mean, Prior to March of 2020, the economy was actually doing really well. The, the pandemic was this real quick blip, but it came back, and there were only sectors, you know, individual sectors that were affected after that. And so then we started to see these inflationary forces. Uh, so if I had to predict, this index is likely going to go up before it goes down. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Mr. Champagne? Yes. Um just so I'm clear, when you, on page 10, in the right-hand column on the 2023, 22-23 <clears throat> estimate, the ending fund balance of 20866 should carry over to page 11. Yes. Correct? Yeah, okay. Yes, and that's what I was, yeah, that's, that's what, what I said. I'm seeing because something. When I, I saw that this weekend. I, I was curious as to yeah. why it didn't carry over. Yeah, so, so obviously I need to go back and look at that. Um, it should, based on what I'm looking at here, it should be the 20 million 866. Right. You said, and this is something I want to make sure you, I'm clear on too, is that the budget for 23-24 includes a, a tax increase up to the Act 1 index. Is that correct or is that not correct? The tax increase included does not exceed the Act One right, index. Up, up to the Act One. Correct. Index. So it's just a it's a hypothetical calculation as if we were to increase taxes up to the four point nine. The day after the board meeting, you see in the community board passes resolution to go to the index. That is not what this means. What it means is the board is tying its hands to not go above that number. Right, so and I that's just, what I wanted to make sure everyone yes. understood is that we're. We're ca well, we, we will, if we pass that resolution, we will be capped at the 4.9%. What our actual number is, what it, you know, the budget revenues are, 
will be determined as we walk through the process over the next five months. Yes, and that's a very good point to make. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Dr. Whitney. Yeah, just a clarification question for me. This is still somewhat new. So you mentioned that the so our, our adjusted index, uh, which as you say is growing, you said that, that that growth is due to our district becoming less wealthy. And so can you just help me understand why district becoming less wealthy means that that tax number theoretically yeah, goes so, up? Yeah, so the, 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 that wealth metric that they use, which is the market, market value personal income aid ratio, measures wealth within your district. And so as that number goes up, it, it actually means you're becoming less wealthy. So it, it's an aid ratio, so it, 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 it enhances reimbursements and things like that. So as that number goes up, they, the, the General Assembly wrote into the, into the legislation that you have greater ability. Could, because the presumption would be if your community is becoming less wealthy, um, your earned income tax, for instance, may be going down or staying at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Your um, real estate tax base may not be growing. Um, so the presumption is there are other forces at work that are sort of you're, you're, not, you're not seeing the revenues there, so they're giving you extra capacity. And that puts then it in the board's hands to make a decision about whether or not you want to use that capacity. I see. Makes sense. Thank sure. you. Okay, thank you. Are there additional questions? Mr. Bird. I have a couple of questions, uh, Mr. Saul. The state revenue uh, but amount, uh, you have 5.15%. Can you explain how that number would arrive, and is that based on previous numbers or the last couple of years? Or basically, just give a little background on that. Yes, yeah, so I'll just touch on it real quickly. At the next meeting, we're actually going to have a full comprehensive presentation about the revenues, so I don't want to steal my own thunder in advance, but you'll recall that um, after we adopt our budget, in the summer of 2022, um, we adopt a budget that included a, I'll call it a modest state um, um, contribution, right? But the state actually, uh, the state actually adopted a budget that gave, I will call it significant additional funds to the school district. And so we didn't go back and reopen our budget. So we're actually now seeing, quote, the benefit of that, um, applying that to our applying that to our budget. So we're seeing that larger percentage. Okay. And I'll be sure, again, in the revenue to presentation to sort of highlight that piece. One question, I'll make sure I didn't miss this. You said the ESSER funds that remain are not in these calculations. Is that true? Did I miss that? The ESSER funds that remain, um, OK, so let me just clarify. The ESSER funds have actually been used, OK? But when we received the ESSER funds, we basically supplanted, because it was something you're allowed to do with the um, ARP monies. We supplanted and took the local money that we would have spent for salaries and put that in a, in a pot, right, to use for these other reasons. So the ESSER funds have been spent, the money is set aside, and the monies that are set aside are reflected in the fund balance at this point to be used. And we, um, I'll touch on it in a future meeting in terms of how much remains, but that's where you could find them. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Smith. Yeah, a couple of things I was curious about, um, just building off some of the other questions that my colleagues have asked. Um, you mentioned that the adjusted Act 1 index um, is a function of the capacity, in your words, of the, um, the, the, the local income base um, in, in a particular district. Just to, to clarify, as I'm understanding that, so the state has established this um, in response to reduced capacity while also therefore simultaneously giving districts the uh, ability to, to raise taxes at a higher rate from that reduced capacity. Does that make sense compared to a district? A higher versus? rate from, I think what you're asking is the base index or the right. statewide index. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, in, and Mr. Jankowski had asked about the trend over time and, and the way that it's, um, it's increasing um, over the last several, several years. And um, you know, that part I understand. The, I don't think you, you highlighted the part about how um, the two, uh, the base and the adjusted are, are 
there, there's a trend there as well. Like that, not only is the overall base and the adjusted increasing, but the, the gap between the two is increasing as well. That is specific to East Penn. That's not a function of national macroeconomic uh, factors as much, is it? N no, that because because the the um, adjustment is based on our local. Right. Yes, so that is that is a local adjustment. So when you look at the gap and the widening gap, that that is a very high level indicator of kind of the state of the district and 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 the community here. Fair to say. Yeah, I think it, it. Yes, in terms of trends, I think if you look at this trending, I mean, there was a time where our index was unadjusted, and what we don't know is at that point, you know, how much lower that that aid ratio was. Mm -hmm. Right, and obviously now that aid ratio is higher than that point for trigger point. Um, so yeah, I think it, you certainly can draw some con some conclusions from that. Uh, the last thing I was curious about, and this is not something I'm interested in seeing actually come to pass by any stretch of the imagination. But mm -hmm. something I've always kind of wondered was the, the referendum piece of Act 1. I've never heard of that going to referendum in any district, um, <clears throat> certainly locally, but you have a broader statewide picture. Do you know of anybody or any district that has actually done that, put it to the voters, and for what purpose is there? Um, I am familiar with districts that... Um, put it to the voters. I don't know of any, there may have been one that passed, like uh, it's one or no, zero. I mean, essentially yeah. it's zero. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I was just curious if you had any inside yeah. from your broader statewide seat. It, you know. it tends not to be successful. Right. I, mean, I, I, would, I would assume so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Any, Dr. Whitney. Real quick follow up. So on this adjusted index, uh, presuming the trend continues and that delta widens between the statewide and the adjusted index. Is there uh, some kind of any kind of a cap built in at some point? Does that delta delta just keep growing or is there a limit? Yeah, there is a cap. So that aid ratio, once it it, it, it caps out at one and you there couldn't okay. be any greater adjustment. Okay. And and we know what is our aid ratio number between that point four and one? It sit in that is Um, I just need to remember where I wrote it down because I sure. knew this question was going to come up. Put you on the spot. Um, give me one second. Sure. First part is zero point. I'm sorry? I said the first part is zero point. point yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Right. I know where I put it. I typed it right in my speaking notes. Um, it is point four three seven three this year. Okay. So we're, you know. We're very close to the point where it yeah. adjusts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any further comments or questions? Well, I'd like to thank Mr. Saul again for his uh, uh, preparation and, and putting this uh, initial outlook uh, together. I look forward to the sequence of presentations we're gonna get and look forward to the process and, and watching how we can refine the numbers and, and uh, uh, be as efficient as possible with, with what we're doing in terms of the budget. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saul. Okay, with that, uh, moving on to the next item is to uh, take a motion to uh, adopt the 2023-2024 real estate tax increase resolution not to exceed the Act 1 index. May I have a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, Ms. Ms. Allen, would you please call the roll? Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. <clears throat> uh, next item on the agenda is to uh, adopt the um, the ARP ESSER Health and Safety Plan. Uh, I'll note that this is a biannual review as required by the Pennsylvania Department of Education and that there have been no changes to the plan uh, that we last approved uh, back in August 2022. Uh, with that, may I take a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any questions, comments, concerns? I, uh, Ms. Bowman. Just a point of clarification. Is the health of 
health and safety plan review team still meeting? We do not meet, although I will say that they have, the plan has been shared with the team and individual feedback has been solicited if there was any feedback on the plan. No, I, I wasn't suggesting that it should meet. It, I, I understand that we have to have a plan mm -hmm. um, because the state says we have to have one. I, I was just curious if having the plan meant that anything was actually happening. And you, so you answered my question that nothing is. So that, thank you. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any further question, comment? Ms. Allen, please <clears throat> call the roll. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Nay. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Eight ayes, one nay. Thank you, Ms. Allen. <coughs> Our next item on the agenda is personnel. Uh, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any questions, comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, before we move on, I believe Dr. Campbell has some comments. Yes, I just wanted to um, point out that as with the, the personnel items in this particular agenda, the board um, approved or accepted um, Mrs. Lynn Brinkman's resignation of her intent, or I should say her intention to resire, resign from um, East Penn at effective August 2nd, 2023. And so I just wanted to take a moment to point out um, that Lynn has served the East Penn School District. Um, at the end of this year, it will have been 21 years of dedicated service in various capacities, many of those years as an elementary special education supervisor, mm -hmm. um, followed by an elementary principal at Shoemaker Elementary, and she is currently at Lincoln Elementary. And so we certainly have valued and appreciated Lynn's leadership. Um, and I will also say, you know, our team is always appreciative of... Um, a timeline that that is generous and allows us pr plenty of time to begin to begin um, a recruitment uh, this spring. Okay, just thank you, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Levinson, just to clarify real quick, she's retiring, not resigning. Retiring. Right? I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is business operations. Uh, if there's no objection, I'd like to take items A through D together. Uh, but before I ask for that motion, I'd like to make a note that under item 7D, there is an, an, an addition uh, of a, um, for use of district facilities uh, for Skills USA Council uh, is requesting the rental of the auditorium and cafeteria at Iyer Middle School for on Thursday, January 26, 2023, to hold their awards ceremony. Uh, again, I'd like to take uh, items A through D together. If there are no objections, I'd have a motion. I, I object to that. Could we uh, take C separate? Sure, sure. Uh, in that case, uh, I'd like to take items A, B, and D together. I have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Any comments, questions? Yeah. Seeing none, Ms. Allen, will you please call the roll? Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Okay. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Okay, th and thank you for uh, asking for that, Mr. Flaley. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to take a motion for item C under business operations. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, are there any questions, comments, concerns from mm -hmm. the board? Ms. Bowman? Yeah, I just have a few questions. Um, I, I know because he's told me that Mr. Smith is, is very under, aware of Panorama and what it is, but um, I don't know if the rest of the board is, and I know I'm not. Um, as much as the different people have tried to explain its function, what it does, and all of its powers and things, um, 
We've only had it, what, for a year? Is that correct in place? Or is it two years now? Um, we've actually implemented it since 2021. Okay. I was wondering if the board could get a demo at some point so that we can understand what, because it's really hard to understand. I mean, of all the things that have been explained to me during my time on the board, I, I found this software the hardest to um, understand how it works and what it does and really struggle to explain it to other people. But um, that said, my the question that I want to ask um, is kind of related to what the speaker brought up earlier. Um, could you talk about why understanding students on a deeper level can help the district um, improve academic performance? Sure, and let me also, um, I will answer your question. I also want to share um, publicly because there is action for the board to take tonight specific to Panorama. Um, Panorama offers a variety of services and resources for school districts, including East Penn. Um, in East Penn, we have the Panorama technology platform that actually manages student assessment data. And so in a dashboard-like style, all of our professional staff members have access to student assessment data on the students on their caseload. Um, when we talk about student assessment data, certainly we're talking about um, course grades, we're referring to standardized assessments um, on in core academic subjects. And so there, are, there is academic information that's housed in that student assessment piece of Panorama. Panorama also offers districts a variety of survey instruments. Um, again, research-based tools that have been developed and are available to districts. One of the tools that we, one of the surveys, or I should say two of the surveys that we administer typically biannually are, is to students at the elementary as well as the secondary level. This is perceptual data connected to social and emotional learning as we refer to SEL. At the secondary level, um, there is an equity and inclusion piece to that survey. Again, I'm a little bit of, of information that I think that's important to share publicly. We notify families well in advance of assessment administration. We make all of the questions available for families to review, and we also offer the, offer the opportunity to opt out of the survey administration if families so choose. Um, in terms of that perceptual data and why it's so important is certainly, as you know, um, when we talk about SEL and the types of data that's gathered, it relates to and is collected and organized into overarching themes in terms of students' sense of belonging to a school. And so, as we know, that's a core essential piece for individuals to feel a sense of belonging and connectedness to each other and or to adults in the building um, in order to be successful learners. And so that's just one example of the importance of SEL and, man and monitoring. Are we doing a good job at what we set out to do and as is articulated in our, in our comprehensive plan? Okay, thank you. And this the other piece I'll say is we do also then publicly share the results of the survey data. We've made public presentations at board meetings. It's also available on the district website for any families who wish to go back um, and take a look at that information that we've gathered. And that information is then used by us to, to develop plans in terms of how we can improve um, how our students are performing in those areas. This agreement is for both parts of the panor panorama. It is, yeah. and so it's a okay. it's a two year agreement as well. And one of the things that I thought um, originally, I think two years ago when this first came up, um, that I thought was a pretty big selling point um, for me as a parent was, um, you know, and I, and I have talked to other parents with kids with either IEPs or five hundred fours where they mention that teachers don't follow what's in the plan. And I can understand how that could happen if you have a class of 
I don't know what our class size is, but let's say 30 kids and 10 of them have 10 different um, accommodations and the teacher doesn't always remember what they are. And it was explained to me that this system helps them to, under, to remember from class to class who um, needs different accommodations so that um, it's consistent throughout the day. Is that correct? I will say again, um, in terms of the, the student data management piece, if I'm a, as our, for our professional staff members, it is accurate that they can go in, their students are organized by course period, and so for each student there is a dashboard that shows some basic um, and has access to some demographic data um, related to students. Is there a specialized learning plan for them? And then again, um, information regarding those specific assessments that we talked about in terms of their academic areas. Okay. And then could you, I, I, we had a meeting about this, but I don't know how long, um, just explain, I, I, mostly for the community, the link between sense of belonging and academic performance. Um, in addition to sen sense of belonging, there's also overarching categories in terms of like self-management skills. How do students respond um, perhaps during what might be a stressful situation? Um, but in terms of the connection between a sense of belonging and how students perform um, academically, really what we're talking about is a culture or an environment for learning. And so I think we all, in thinking about understanding the basics of human behavior, um, it's important that we have positive relationships and have that sense of connection and belonging to a community of learners in order to be successful academically. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Mr. Jankowski. A couple questions. One, just to follow up on what Ms. Bowman said. So, so to be clear, we are utilizing the, the, the various features of this software beyond just the survey? There's, there's multiple components to it, and so yes, you're, you're absolutely right. The one piece is the data management piece, um, and so that's where we have, in terms of teachers are able to see their students' academic performance, again, dashboard-like feature, I use that term in terms of, you know, succinctly captures a lot of academic information on students. And then, in addition, Panorama offers survey tools, which we do in East Penn use the SEL survey as well as the equity and inclusion survey at the secondary level. Okay, so is there a, is the survey a primary factor for us to procure this <clears throat> software, or it, it, is um, the value of the other features also something that is there's, important to us? I would say there's equal value in, the, in the, the tools that are available to us in Panorama, which is the overarching um, company. And then with respect to the survey, are we actually putting into effect changes um, in response to the results of those surveys, or is that just data we're collecting and putting it on a shelf somewhere? Um, well, as you can appreciate, like we have identified um, social and emotional learning, SEL, as a priority in our comprehensive plan. And so, um, of course, we absolutely use that data to say, what are the areas, whether it's as a district in which our students are performing well, perhaps more importantly, what are the areas as a district in which we really need to put some, some, more, some additional supports and interventions in place? Perhaps what's even more valuable is that, as you can appreciate, we're able to drill down and our, our, our leadership teams can look at that information by level and by building. So at the secondary level, what are the strengths and what are the needs of our students at the elementary level similarly? And then at the building level, are there specific supports that we can put in place? So when we think about um, in elementary classrooms, you know, we, we have done public communication in terms of what is social and emotional learning and what does it look like at the elementary level? We talked about morning meetings where it's just an opportunity for kids to come together and have focused conversation and discussion. 
Um, at the high school level, we've had a lot of conversations here at the board level. We've talked about Hornet Homeroom, which is a common block of time that students have um, on a consistent basis, same teacher, same group of kids from different grade levels who establish those consistent relationships. And again, there's some programming then that can happen for students okay. during that per period of time. Thank you. Mr. Bird? Yes, I have a couple of comments. Uh, I, I understand the panorama has a lot of uh, different programs, a lot of uh, positive things. I think one thing the district has done, which I really appreciate, they've looked at that as a tool to use to improve a lot of things, social emotional learning. One of the things that really uh, stepped out to me is uh, there was a lot of things about test scores and our performance about students. I think one thing that's really is involved in that is feeling including and belonging, like our superintendent just commented. And that's one thing that survey does evaluate how students feel about equity and inclusion and belonging. That does affect the performance of a student. If a student spends his whole day or her own day worrying about being including and belonging, it does affect their performance, not only in day-to-day -day classes, but also in state assessments. I think the district can realize that. They're looking at this data, and I think they use this data in a positive method to make a change in the performance of students. I will be voting for that contract. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bird. Mr. Champagne. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate everyone's comments. I, isn't it also true that this software package integrates with our other systems, the power school system, where, where there is, you know, the, the, the where what that warehouses the the, the data the, on each student? Um, so it's an integrated approach across all of the software systems to allow the district to really understand and the teachers to understand how and where students are in terms of their coursework. Um, and, and not just um, with respect to um, standardized tests and so forth? There's certainly a synchronization in terms of cer some certain data pieces would be pulled, yes, into Panorama. Okay. And then also with respect to um, the, uh, the, the surveys, isn't it also fair to say that those surveys feed into the MTSS kind of platform that we've set up for the district, that the, the multi-tiered system of supports is driven through a lot of this, you know, social emotional learning and other areas of ident that we've identified to support students' mental health, um, which is, you know, an area that I think everyone on this board is concerned about. Um, that is, you know, one of the, the foremost things that I think all school districts are facing. And so, you know, these tools are part of that whole calculation is to figure out how we can best support students. Is that, would that be a fair characterization? I think that's fair. Again, it, it, we get, um, we can get district and building level data. We could, I should say we could look at the, the, the data um, at the macroscopic level and really look at district-wide, how are we doing in terms of core programs. Um, and then certainly when you talk about MTSS or those teams that are maybe drilling down a little bit more, are there specific interventions that we could partner with like communities and schools and programs might be offered um, if that particular need is identified? Okay. Thank you. Dr. Whitney. What is our opt-out rate for the surveys? Do we have that, that number that you can share? Or roughly? We absolutely do. I would, I honestly, I don't want to speak, I, I want to look at the information and I can get that back to the board and even report out it, report it out at a public meeting. Um, but yes, we have that data. Can you say whether that has been increasing or decreasing over the time that we've had this, these contracts? Um, I can say, I'm going to speak in generality, but um, you likely recall that in particular at the secondary level, um, after the first year of administration, one of the concerns was that our participation rate was, was relatively low. Um, that's not a statistical descriptor, um, but it was relatively low. And we weren't sure, again, just because of the fact that um, during that particular school year, many of our secondary students were primarily remote. So about 60% of our high school students spent that year as remote learners. Um, and so that data was not very valuable or robust for us. And, and I will say that certainly that participation rate for the secondary level has increased significantly. Um, but those actual opt-out rates we can get for you. Sure. And 
to kind of follow with that and go back to Mr. Jankowski's question about follow up. So I'm I'm seeing you know the time frame here. Obviously, we have a contract that runs through this school year. This contract that's on the table for us to vote is for the 2023-24 and 24-25 school years. Um, and so that's, uh, if I'm understanding right, that's eight more administrations. No, four more administrations right. of the surveys, right? And thus far, we've had how many administrations of the surveys? At three, four? Three. Uh, something left. I guess, so my question, my reason for asking is, you know, while I support overall um, the need for this survey and the and the and the information that it's giving us, and I see the importance of it, I'm wondering long term: do we see this as something that needs to continue for you know how 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 long do we see the need for the surveys, right? And if we continue the surveys, even with this two-year time period that's on the table tonight. Um, do the surveys change at all, and or does our response to the survey data change at all? And I know it depends on the results, and I know our response depends on what we find out, but do you see my question? I guess I'm, I'm just looking at the long-term time frame yeah, and how I, long we see this being a, a I need. guess if you're asking, you know, is will we continue to administer the surveys sort of for an undefined period of time in the future? Um, and or do I see potentially the, you know, currently we I, we administer the survey fall and spring. Um, and I will share again, certainly part of that is because we are putting quite a few interventions or strategies in place. Um, and again, I don't mean to go back to only the sense of belonging, but you might recall that was one particular area that certainly was some guiding data for our comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that we wanted to um, monitor progress in certain areas quite regularly so that we could be sensitive to any changes. Potentially, certainly it is something um, that we might look to decrease the frequency of administration um, mm -hmm. in a period of time. But, but I don't have an answer tonight in terms of when, when or if that shift would happen. Um, and I think with anything, like our, that our administrative team continues to monitor the usefulness of all resources and tools in the district, whether it's instructional resources, um, curricular resources. Um, in this case, there's certainly a technology resource in terms of the, da the, the data warehouse piece, if you will. And then there's also the survey piece to, um, to Panorama that, again, continue to monitor it and, yeah. and make determinations in terms of, is this a priority in terms of which, you know, I appreciate the feedback that was given this evening as part of public comment. That really is what, you know, the, that really is part of our regular responsibility in terms of monitoring how we use those financial resources in the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that answer, and I, I appreciate it. And I do think that this is a critical part of how we educate students is to understand, well, certainly their mental health, but also their social and emotional health. And I'll just say, I mean, I, you know, I, and the reason I asked started by asking about opt-out rates, right, because uh, it's clear that panorama has become sort of a dirty word and a stand-in in our community, in some facets of our community, for any number of sort of perceptions and misperceptions about how we are educating our students and what we are educating our students on, and that it's seen in some quarters as being unnecessary and extraneous and, and damaging. And I don't agree with that perception, but I think it's an important thing for us to keep an eye on, and that's why I question, you know, are we gonna continue with Panorama, which carries, is carrying with it something of a negative public perception in the district, versus, you know, are we going to consider other avenues for achieving the same data? I plan to vote for this contract tonight, but I do think in a long-term sense that would be something I'd want to think about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? Mr. Smith. Yeah, I had uh, uh, several. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out where, where, where I want to go first with this. Um, I guess I'll just... I guess I'm an expert or something on Panorama, even though I'm really not. But um, 
panorama is not perfect. Um, it's not. Um, and I'm going to make a, a comparison to standardized testing. That's not perfect either. Um, but when we look at our role as a district and, and our mission, we are not just concerned about academic success and, you know, we're, we're concerned about, you know, students' overall well-being. Um, and while there are many challenges that many of us here sh share and share this opinion with regard to state testing and the, the, the importance of it and the need for it and the uh, voluminous amounts of data that are, are uh, you know, being uh, poured over by, by Harrisburg and, um, you know, there's similar concerns with Panorama as well from the non-academic side. Um, the there's still it's voluminous data. It's um, you know being being we're, we're trying to get a sense of, of of where our kids are at, not academically, but on the the well being whole child side. Um, one of the concerns, not really concerned, but one of the challenges that I have with with Panorama is is it's more granular. It's um, things like you know third graders are are being presented with questions where they may not know necessarily, they might not, might not have the vocabulary background to be able to understand what that question is asking. Forget about what the question itself is truly asking. They may not just flat out understand it. Um, and so there's some there's some concerns out there that with that. Um, there, some teachers have concerns with the representative sample that's collected of students that they, they teach and, um, you know, how those scores are being attributed to them and, and the, whether it's a representative sample of all the kids that they work with or not. Um, you know, and all those are going to happen, those kinds of concerns are gonna happen regardless of how you go about collecting that level of information, which I believe is an important um, body of information to understand about our kids. We, we, we wanna know um, not just how they're doing academically, how they're growing, but we wanna know how they're doing like if I sat down with a student I said okay how are you today I'm not you know I'm not necessarily so concerned about math or what they got on their sciences the day before I just want to know are they did they get a breakfast that morning did they um, or were they kept up that night because their um, you know their parents were, were fighting or their barriers that are impacting their ability to go to school and succeed academically that day um, panorama is one company that has a suite of products that tries to get to the bottom of how we can go about answering that question. Um, and some would argue to varying degrees of success, that's what they're doing. Um, so I guess the, the question that I have um, for uh, the administration is, are you aware of any other similar suite of products or competitors to Panorama that is a research-based way to identify students who are struggling with non-academic uh, factors that serve as barriers to academic success that is also able to compare those changes in that data over time and is able to measure that performance against peers nationwide. Is there anybody out there that would be able to check all three of those boxes that you are aware of? Not that I'm aware of off okay. the top of my head, but I will say just in terms of process, like uh, just in, in terms of process of vetting resources, um, several years ago we had a team of K to 12 professional staff members who who looked at multiple resources um, and certainly, th again, through a process had identified Panorama as um, the tool that would best meet the needs of the organization. And, and when we think about, you know, again, we've talked, we've had some conversation about the data warehouse management piece and then there's also the research-based student perceptual surveys that are available online. And so um, 
there are other surveys that have been administered to students or developed by the state. Um, I think the, again, the, I'm going to say the quality of data that we get is certainly very different. And the example that I give is the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, which is another survey that um, is administered statewide to secondary students. Um, and again, there's, we've, we have had some great discussion about the PAYS survey in, at the board, with the board. Um, and again, I think there were, you know, certainly concerns about the, the quality of data that we get back then and are able to do something with it in response to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, to follow up to that very lengthy question, um, you know, I, I put a, certainly a level of importance of making sure that our students are not just learning, but are able to learn on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I, it sounds like based on what we know so far that those three boxes are only being checked by Panorama, which brings me to my next concern is that they don't, as far as we know, seem to have a competitor that can do the same thing. Certainly we can make our own, own surveys in house, but then, you know, how do we, make it research-based, how do we compare that nationally? We, we can't do it if we do that in-house. So they, from what I'm hearing, don't seem to have much of a competitor, which brings me a little level of concern now because um, the we are paying 63,000, and the contract is, is asking for 63,000 a year. I look back at April 26th of 2021 and the, hold to your contract, unless I'm reading it wrong, was $68,000. So my concern now is that despite all of the many benefits that it provides to our students, okay, putting that aside, my concern is they know that they're only, they're only game in town. They got us in the door for 68 total for two years, and now they're upping that to 63. Am I reading the contract wrong from um, the 26th? I, be yeah. I believe, I appreciate the question. Um, I believe it was 68 was the original annual cost for the contract. And with this, it actually reflects a multi-year discount. Um, so the, the, the annual rate would actually be lower than what we had paid for a single year. Okay. Okay. So I would say I just pulled that up and read it in the period of time that we had this conversation today. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a chance to go look through it to that level of detail. Okay. Um, that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, but like I said, it's not, it's not perfect, but I don't think there's anything else out there that checks those boxes. Um, and I would just, you know, if, if this goes forward tonight, caution us in, as we, look into the future that we're not being taken advantage of as the as the only game in town yeah I, I and I appreciate um, the feedback and I will say as well um, speaking for an admi speaking for our administrative team like we bring forth a recommendation because we see value in the resources um, and we support them in terms of Again, the value of the data management piece and then the feedback that we get from the surveys. Um, for our team, this is not a matter of, well, there's nothing else out there, so let's just go with this. Um, if that were the case, we wouldn't bring forth any, any agreement at this point in time. Um, and again, I believe, and, and we can certainly double check on that, but I believe, Mr. Smith, it's actually... Um, going with the two-year agreement, we, it gives us an annual discount as part of that. Okay. 5%. Ms. Bowman. Um, yeah, a quick question and then also a quick comment, or I think it's a quick question. Could you tell me um, how much time out of the school day these take to fill out the surveys? I'm going to I'm going to look to my team. I would say maximum 30 minutes, probably less than like 
more like 15. Elementary is less than 30. Yeah. And that's twice a year. Yes. Okay, so maybe a total of an hour a year at the most. And that's going to be maximum. I'm going to say probably closer to like the 15 minute piece, and that includes like, you know, administration and. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I just have one more. Okay, sorry. Um, so this is just my, my comment. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that affect um, a student's ability to learn. Um, and gosh, would it be so simple if we could just only teach subjects to students and all of them would learn and or teach subjects better to students and they would all learn. But we know from research that many different factors affect whether or not a student learns science, math, reading, anything, um, among them whether or not they're hungry, whether or not they're depressed, whether or not um, they're experiencing violence at home, and I'm sure the list goes on and there's people in this room that know more of those factors than I do. But um, I see this as a diagnostic tool, much like our physicians use to figure out what's going on in our bodies before they give us a medicine. So if I think of the classroom teacher as the medicine, we need to diagnose what's wrong so that um, we're giving the right ones to the students so they actually learn what they need to learn. And um, I just wanted to mention the one thing that you said about sense of belonging, because when that came up, however long it was ago when the first survey came out, I was floored that 40, or I think it was, I'm going off the top of my head, 40 or 50 percent of our kids feel like they don't belong in our schools. That's an important factor for us to improve in order to help these kids who are being left behind. Um, it's, it's so clear from that one statistic some of what's wrong and some of where we need to go, and if we don't continually survey, we'll, we'll never know if we're addressing it or not. We'll never know if we're improving. So for that reason, um, I'm going to vote yes on this. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Mr. Bird? I have one comment. I just want to piggyback on what Mrs. Bowman said. That is very important that students feel like they belong. It does affect their performance, that they are inclusive in this uh, cultural environment we have in our mm -hmm. district. But it's very critical. Now, we can measure that and make improvements and make improvement at the district and also the student's performance. I just want to ask one question. How does the opt-out uh, procedure work for a parent or a student? How does that work? Um, it's handled through each building principal. And so when the communication is sent out weeks before the survey is planned to be administered, there are directions in terms of um, who families can contact. Again, they're also given the opportunity to review all the questions ahead of time. Um, and then each building maintains um, a list that's communicated to those who will be administering the survey in terms of students who are um, to not be, who, students who are to not take the survey. So if a parent doesn't want it, the, the child, the student has to participate. Correct. So there's no intrusion. Absolutely privacy. not. What's what, yep. The district doesn't do that. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Any additional comments? I'd just like to say in closing, I appreciate this discussion very much. Uh, my peers uh, certainly asked some good questions and brought up some, some very good points based on their own understanding of what this survey is about. Um, again, you know, in my own view, you know, the panorama or whatever platform that we were to choose is, 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 a, is a platform that's primarily a data-driven uh, uh, tool that's used to help boost student achievement. And you can look at that in terms of uh, individual academic subject matter. You can look at it in terms of their experiences, and you can look at it in overall well-being. So you know, if we go to the contract itself, you look at what we're getting with this license. Um, you know, As Dr. Campbell had explained before, this is a dashboard-based system and reporting platform that's used for teachers, uh, student support staff, school administrators, and district administrators to, again, you know, assess the, 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 uh, the academic and personal health of the, uh, of the students. So in addition to the survey tools, which, you know, I, I, we may have, you know, in, in some ways, um, you know, put a disproportionate emphasis on what this platform does, you know, it, it's used 
again, is data for intervention, intervention tracking, uh, ongoing integration of things like SAT, FastBridge, iReady, PSSA, Keystone, uh, Swiss Suite, I'm not sure what that is, um, into, uh, into success, student success platform. Um, it's ongoing integration in, into our other uh, management platforms like PowerSchool and standard filters into standard success platform, including behavior, attendance, coursework, rosters, and demographics. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting something that, that's, that's incredibly important and as, a, as a general tool that, that, that uh, you know, we can use to, you know, you know help students achieve, help them to improve, and, and help get to the bottom of what it is that, that, that may be holding somebody back in terms of uh, the, where their potential is. So um, if there's nothing further, uh, again, I appreciate the discussion. Um, and I believe we already moved on this. So, Ms. Allen, uh, would you please call the roll? Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Nay. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Eight ayes, one nay. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Okay. Um, Moving on to uh, curriculum, uh, before I call for a motion, I'd like to call attention that uh, there is some additional uh, items to approve. And again, like, like the other one has been posted earlier today, uh, two conferences are, were added uh, for tonight, uh, Sean Nolan and Christopher Stuchko, both attending the Pennsylvania Educational Technology Expo and Conference uh, coming up in February. Um, so. Uh, with that, for curriculum for educational conferences, I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Next on the agenda is policy. We have multiple new policies uh, and an update of a current policy for a first reading. Um, would you want to use Dr. Yes, Dr. Okay. Povolitis is going to um, start off just by giving a very high level summary of the policies. We appreciate that there are quite a few policies coming before the board tonight. Um, I will share that. You know, one of the pieces of information you'll hear about is as a result of a change in legislation, there's really um, that change has an impact on multiple policies. Um, so although there are many policies here, I think you'll find that the overall content um, is, is not dramatic. Hopefully you perceive that. <laughs> <laughs> So good evening. So um, the three different categories that Dr. Campbell spoke of, um, I'll kind of break them down and just give a brief overview of each. Um, 011 is principles for governance and leadership. The second category um, in front of you this evening is the larger category, educational instability, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. We have eight policies in this group. And then that third category, uh, policy 719, is unmanned aircraft systems or drones. So we have those three different areas. So if it's, if it's OK with the board, I'll just go by each category and see if there's any comments or, or uh, feedback. So the first category, again, 011, Principles for Governance and Leadership. This is PSBA's um, uh, periodically they review with a task force, which includes school directors and superintendents from school districts throughout the Commonwealth to ensure the language is reflective of current needs and practices on the board. The most recent suggestions from that team are included in our draft policy. I will share that um, Mr. Champagne did reach out uh, in advance um, with a suggestion to retain the last two bullet points under Act Ethically on page two of three. Um, and so those are abide by the majority decision and always maintain confidentiality um, on matters discussed in executive session. And so if, um, if everyone is okay with that suggestion, we'll take the strike strikes out of there and we'll maintain those two bullets. Okay. 
I think good. Yeah. So well, I will keep. I will then remove those strikes, and that'll be reflected in second reading. That we're going to bring those back, so they'll be bold, so you can see that there'll be a change there. Okay. Are there any other questions regarding zero one one? Ms. Bowman. Ms. Bowman. It's just a, a point of clarification, not necessarily. And um, somewhere on here, it says that the board will do a self-assessment, and I don't. I didn't know what that was, or whether or not we're actually currently doing anything like that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember which thing it's under. Evaluate continuously. Yeah, yeah it's under. Bottom of page two. The, the bottom of page two of three, is that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it's in bold. Conduct a board self-assessment on a recurring basis. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, again, this is from PSBA's team that they recommend that. That's really open-ended, and it's really up to the board. If you would adopt this and adopt what PSBA is suggesting, suggesting then there would be some, time, some type of uh, review or self-assessment. It could be as simple as... I mean, I, I would like, actually like to take adop, the opportunity to chime in on this. Um, I, I took a recent board leadership training session, which discussed this aspect, and it got me thinking that this is probably going to be a good idea. Um, so I guess I could work with the administration to perhaps reach out to PSBA to get suggestions as to how we can go about doing that. I, I think they might have some canned mm -hmm. programs that we can use, and, and certainly anything that we can do to... Uh, you know, help us be more effective as a board, I think is a good idea. So, so Ms. Bowen, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, again, I'd be interested in knowing what we can get, garner from people. Sure. And I can tell you from a, from a general corporate governance perspective for companies, that's, that's a common practice. Okay, any other thoughts or feedback? Okay, great. So um, moving on to that second category, um, students experiencing educational instability. Um, earlier this year, a new section in the PA school code became law. The title of the new section of the school, co school code is called Assisting Students Experiencing Educational Instability. The law requires a school entity to put several supports in place for these students. Based on the definition of ed educational instability and the fact that a student experiencing foster care may also qualify a, um, as a student experiencing educational instability as defined in the law, policies 251, homeless students, and 255, educational stability for children in foster care, have been merged together under this larger umbrella, um, calling uh, now with this new policy 251, and the policy is students experiencing homelessness, foster care, and other educational instability. So that's this big bucket. In addition, so that's one policy. In addition to policy 251, seven other policies have language added, which is related to educational instability. The reason they're in front of you now is simply language um, from this law has been added to these policies. So I'll just quickly read them. 200 enrollment of students, 202 eligibility of non-resident students, 204 attendance, 217 graduation, 221 dress and grooming, 233 suspension expulsion, and 810 transportation. Um, I'll now move on to um, a few questions that were asked in advance. Um, again, thank you for that. Dr. Levison asked a few questions. He had asked what impact this has overall. Um, we do have 34 students in East Penn School District who fall into this category and under this umbrella. Um, we do already currently support these students with everything that's outlined in the policy. So we have been um, implementing the supports that are there in place. They're in there by law, by law now, but um, we've been supporting these students um, and following these guidelines prior to it actually becoming law. Um, we were already required to support homeless and foster care students um, with these practices, so this new law is put into place, provides an umbrella that which I had mentioned before, which also now includes court-placed students. Um, but again, we currently have the supports in place for all these students. Um, he also asked if we need to expand our staff. We have a home and school visitor, which will continue to support these students. Um, she currently does support um, the students that are homeless. Um, and Dr. Mir Mirabella in his office uh, works with um, foster care students and the homeless students as well. Um, there will be no added cost to the district. Um, and so that, that 
uh, pulls together all the questions that, that Ms. Dr. Levison had asked. Uh, Mr. Champagne also asked um, just some information about the home and school visitor. This is a position that we've had in the district for several years. Um, she provides the support outlined in these policies and completes needed home visits. Um, and then one other uh, addition uh, Mr. Champagne is asking for under authority item number four, which is on page three of eight, he is suggesting adding technical education fees um, to that area. And so if there's no concerns about adding technical education fees, again, on page three of eight, under authority area item four, I'm happy to add that language for second reading. Yeah, my, my reason for doing that is that, you know, at LCTI, some of the students are required to, you know, they need uniforms, they need other materials and so forth. So as a sending district, I think, you know, we should obviously take responsibility if they cannot provide that for themselves up there uh, and, and step in and, and mm -hmm. take care of them. So that was my thought process behind that. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Bowman? Um, just a, a point of, I'm just trying, I want to make sure I understand the one policy. Um, I don't really have an issue with it. The one, the eligibility one, which I think is 202. I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the legal language. You probably don't even need to look at it to answer my question. Okay. But um, we're, according to this policy, a non-resident student would attend East Penn if they're currently living with someone, whether in foster care or maybe a not so house situation, but within the district boundaries. This isn't like a non-resident homeless student who's currently living in Easton wouldn't be attending East Penn. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, okay. like there's some parameters where things might happen with a student that falls in this umbrella where they may be living outside the boundaries, but it's because they're home. There's, there's different reasons for that. Okay, thank you. That, that's all. I just wanted to make sure I understood that one. And then I, oh, is it 221, the, the dress and grooming one? Um, when I looked at that, I thought there might be an opportunity here for us to add something to that policy about religious exemptions, um, especially because that policy mentions physical education. Um, and if students are required to wear like shorts and a t-shirt and we have some students who um, need to have their arms and legs covered. Um, I'm wondering if we should add something like that to the policy. I can review that with Mr. Fisher. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that's it. Thank you. Did you have more? And so we do have one, that last category, um, new policy 719. Unmanned aircraft, air, unmanned aircraft systems or drone. This is a new policy we are recommending based on a request for a student drone club and the, really the popularity overall drone use today. Um, this policy was written by a team of East Penn administrators with feedback from a teacher and with the support of Mr. Fisher. Um, and we looked at um, several other policies that districts have in place and kind of pulled together what we felt um, was best for us as a district. Um, I'll just continue on with Dr. Levison did ask if he we thought any added restrictions were needed. Um, our team does not think we need to add any additional restrictions for other outdoor events since the district retains the sole and absolute discretion to extend or, res or rescind permission to operate drones on or over school property. Um, athletic events are noted specifically because there's policy in place through PIAA about the use of drones and so that's why that was pointed out separately. So that concludes the questions I received in advance. Any other questions or comments? I thought you, you I thought this policy was well done and I generating it in-house. Um, thought you guys covered the relevant topics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I, I did have a, a question just pop, came to mind. Um, do we currently have a drone issue on, on, on school properties? Any, any known use or unauthorized use? No, we do not. Okay. But not that I know of, not that our team knew of. No. Okay. But maybe there's stealth drones that we don't <laughs> see. Escape pretty much. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Dr. Povolitis. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Look forward to next meeting where we'll have a second reading. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on. There are no other items. So I'll go to announcements. Uh, 
We had an exec executive session this evening where we covered confidential matters. Our next regular board meeting uh, is on Monday, February 13th at 7.30 in the boardroom. Uh, with no further business, I'd like to get a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those, Second. In, Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the month.